here. Okay. Okay. I just use the thing. Um, well, good morning. It's a great pleasure to see you all. A privilege and delight to be invited to contribute to this this branch of the UNA. Um, as uh, a speaker put, pointed out, you know, I, I'm at LSE. I'm vaguely retired. I'm not sure academics ever really retire. Um, the book I've written, How Did Britain Come to This, is <laughs> cry of pain, really, about what's happened to the country over my lifetime. And um, since I was retired, I had the time to look into what, what, what's gone wrong. The subtitle of the book is A Century of Systemic Failures of Governance. And the, one of the themes of the book is that every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. The reason why everything's failing all around us is not an accident. It's because some of the design to fail in that way, and that's the theme of the talk. Um, uh, this doesn't <laughs> uh, if I go in. Oh, there we are. Okay, right. So I'm, I'm going to talk very briefly. Uh, I aim to make it about half an hour less if I can. And I'm going to go through the round, round relatively quickly. So there's plenty of time for questions and discussions and clarification. The, the, one, of, one of the big ideas in the book is that what are described as political settlements that lay the foundations under which governments work under different parties of government. And there were two major settlements in the 20th century. The first was uh, Clement Attlee's Labour government from 1945 to 51 that laid the foundations under which uh, the that that Labour government governed and successive Conservative and Labour governments until 1979, when, as I will explain, it was seen to be failing. And Margaret Thatcher was elected on a radical programme of what we describe as neoliberalism. I'm going to describe what neoliberalism is all about, because it's often used as a term of abuse. Um, and then, what I want to focus on, the core of the talk, is what we've experienced as the privatization of profits and socialization of losses. <clears throat> Catastrophically, of course, after the global financial crisis, where the bankers walked away with their obscene bonuses and the rest of us suffered austerity to pay it back. But what I want to explain also is that applies to privatization and outsourcing of government contracts. Um, which is a key part of the neoliberal reforms. At the end, I mean, towards, I mean, the final bit is just this truly distressing part of the way inequalities become entrenched in Britain uh, under neoliberalism. And I see that as a cause of why people voted for Brexit, as one woman remarked in the Northeast, being told that leaving the EU would damage our GDP. She said, it's not my GDP. And finally, at the end, question for you as to what sort of society we have got. So, basically, oh, um, what, what we've got here is the world of the 1930s. And the point about the Atlee settlement is that what it aimed to do was to tackle the problems of the 1930s. And there was this horrendous process. I mean, what was going on there were areas with horrendously high rates of unemployment. So in Jarrow, was this is an iconic image of the Jarrow Crusade, where men walked 300 miles to London looking for jobs. Unemployment was 70%. And if you were unemployed in the 1930s, you're subjected to, if you wanted anything to live on, it was organized through the humiliating means test. So there was this 1932 hunger march in protest against the means test. That was stigmatizing and humiliating and didn't give you enough to live on. This, these two graphs show um, 
an abiding problem in Britain, which is the, the in a sense, the north-south divide, the line from the Severn to the Wash. This is how unemployment varied across Britain in the first part of the 1930s and the second part of the 1930s. The red areas are where unemployment is lower than average, and the black areas where it's higher than average. And areas of extreme unemployment were the northeast and Wales. Now, extraordinarily, the figure who uh, set the agenda for the Atlee settlement was Sir William Beveridge. Um, he was a complete pain in the neck. Uh, that was his unfortunate. He was the great, one of the great and the good, and he thought he was one of the best. He's been described as the greatest director of LSE in its first century, but was actually forced to resign because he was so unpopular. Uh, he was a very unhappy workaholic. In the First World War, he'd risen to the top of the civil service, knew Churchill and Lloyd George. But come the Second World War, he thought, I'm God's gift to government, they'll surely want me back. And no one wanted him in government. And so it took him a long time to find his way in. And once he got in, he of course upset people so much they wanted to get rid of him. So what they did was to send him to uh, Whitehall's equivalent of Siberia, this is like the eighth labor of Hercules, really. To, the terms of reference were to chair a committee of officials across seven government departments and to undertake a survey of uh, social insurance health and services and make recommendations. And Beveridge understood full well what this meant and went home and wept. And the, and the report he produced in 1942, the Beveridge Report, has this, you can't actually read it, but it, it is a report on social and allied services which you think would be an unlikely title for a bestseller, but people were queuing outside stationary offices to buy copies of this book. And the reason why it was such a success, and this report was transformational, is what, what Beveridge realized, it's the phrase of John Stuart Mill, if you can inform the passion of the multitude against the self-interest of the few, you can, equate, you can await the outcome with quiet satisfaction. And basically, the things that he did was that there was this shocking thing, given the, the terrible lives people had led in the 1930s with hunger and grinding poverty, was his analysis showed that there was no need for that to have happened. The country had easily afforded to abolish it. And the other point he made is this thing about wars now a time for revolutionary change. And in his report, there are these two short paragraphs in which he had identified his five giant evils of want, which is what his report was about, ignorance, disease, squalor, and idleness. And having set the agenda for the Atlee government, that's what they did. Um, so the Atlee settlement drew on uh, reports from the publications under the coalition government and then under the Atlee government. So there was, they, it implemented effectively what Beveridge recommended should happen for Social Security in 1942. And then Keynes uh, came up with policies that committed governments to full employment. Uh, Butler introduced uh, the white paper for free state secondary education for the first time. And my famous namesake, Aniron Bevan, as Minister of Health, was responsible for housing and committed the government to massive building of council houses of quality, and of course is remembered for creating national health service. But the thing I want to emphasize here is the pluralist nature of this settlement. You've got Keynes and Liberal were both, uh, Beveridge and Keynes were both Liberals, Butler was a Conservative, of course, Bevan was a firebrand socialist. Um, and this is Peter Hennessy, the great chronicler of 20th century Britain, looking back, pointing out what a wonderful achievement uh, the Atlee government was. And this is a judgment made over 40 years ago, saying that this, you know, compared to any previous decade or since, and it seems true now, made Britain a kinder, of gentler, and far better place to live, and live, live, work, and die. But the problem was, of course, what the Atlee settlement was about was tackling the problem of the 1930s. To come the 1970s, it's beginning to fall apart. And this is a famous, some of you are my age, you may remember this poster 
of, that led up to the 1979 election campaign by the Conservative government, Sachi and Sach produced this striking poster when unemployment had reached record levels after the Second World War. And uh, along with Margaret Thatcher's election in 1979, her soulmate, Ronald Reagan, was elected in the present United States in 1981. The two of them together pushed forward the neoliberal agenda. And in fact, you know, the, um, it sums up in uh, a phrase from Reagan's inaugural address, in our current crisis, government's not the solution to our problems, government is the problem. Uh, and then in the late 1980s, they appear to be vindicated by the collapse of communism. This is the uh, destruction of the Berlin Wall in 1989. And uh, it seems this is Margaret Thatcher's uh, mantra, there is no alternative, and it seems to be vindicated by that. And this is an analysis showing the, the, this, what we describe as a natural experiment between different parts of Germany in terms of GDP per capita, showing that those in the East, after uh, this is you know, 40 years of communism, were a quarter as well off as those in the West. And so uh, the, uh, and, you know, the authority from this is that, like this source, almost a biblical uh, merit to economist Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, published in 1776. And what they take are these two very famous phrases from that, about talking about self-interest being the thing that drives the butcher, baker, uh, and brewer. And this phrase, the invisible hand, that the market works like the invisible hand to serve social purposes. Um, and it's worth thinking about you know, the mystery of all this. I mean, you can see why uh, I, I only came to economics after doing a master's degree. But if you subject to economics as an adolescent, you can see why it grips the mind, basically. The market looks to be an amazing thing as to why it works. This is a picture of Khrushchev visiting Britain in 1956. The sort of question he would ask is, you know, how do you decide how much bread to produce for London today? He just couldn't believe that he write a system of central planning. It would actually work. But a thing to remember that Adam Smith, and, and there are still a series of books now talking about the way in which the neoliberal economists have selectively neglected key parts of his book, They're talking about you know, with a rich understanding where markets work and fail, talking about basically, you have to remember that suppliers will be out to screw you if they possibly can. Now, what neoliberalism has done is to say there are two you know, things. One is we should go from government to market. I'm sorry about this. this. This is what happens when you switch from uh, one computer to another. The, 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 there's a phrase in white you can't read, but it's go, you go from government to market and public to private ownership. So what the program that's then put in place, is, which we've all experienced, is you privatise utility, outsource uh, government services, and use choice and competition in healthcare and education. Now, Milton Friedman, one of the high priests of neoliberalism in 1970, wrote this report thing in the New York Times saying that all that private industry ought to do is to maximize profits. And the worry was that executives of large corporations might want to do other things like worry about pollution and employers, which uh, Friedman described as pure socialism. So they said what we need to do is to make sure that we have remuneration committees of executives that reward them increase for increasing shareholder value. And what that then leads into the world we describe as a financialized world of financial engineering, in which what you get rewarded for as an executive is basically you know, paying out dividends. If you can run up debt from dividends, that's fine. Uh, if you run up dividends by debt, Buy back shares, that's inevitably going to increase shareholder value. Mergers and acquisitions increases the size of the corporation, therefore means that you need to be paid more if you're running a bigger corporation. You obviously want to minimize tax, you use the tax savings like the Cayman Isles. And the other key thing that you do is to use the law of limited liability put to put subsidiaries in the state of Delaware. You can pay out dividends, and when the company goes bankrupt, you can still hang on to the uh, earnings that you've made and dividends and profits you've got under law of limited liability and the, and the, the, the new the way 
uh, neoliberalism uses the code of capital. So I'm now going to talk about how that's played out with two flagrant examples that, that are, you know, whenever I look at these, they're completely shocking. Um, so the, the thing to understand, this is the core of my argument, as I said, Alan Smith had rich understanding of where markets were, even, you know, back in the 18th century. So if you think about the market for bread as this exemplar of where markets were, that, is, that satisfies a whole set of very stringent conditions. We're very good at buying bread. <laughs> it's not a complicated thing. We do it often. You can assess quality. If you don't like it, you don't go back to the bread shop. The supply side is very weak. They're in competition with each other. No barriers to entry. The markets can test. If you provide awful bread, you'll exit the market. This really is the invisible hand. It's what we call the spot market. I don't go into a bread shop and write a contract for buying bread. I just go in and buy the bread. I look at what's available and decide what I'm going to pay and get it. And regulation of this market is very straightforward. Is the bread going to give me food poisoning? That's not a difficult thing to do. Now, <laughs> we come to this horrendously, you know, you and me are both served by Thames water. Now, the thing is, it's really, I you know, this is just bewildering. Really. I mean, if you compare this, can I go back? I can't go back. Can I go? But, but if you compare this with the market for bread, you can see this is stripped out, basically. All the things that make the bread market work are completely absent. But so Ian Byatt, the uh, first director general of Ofwat, in his you know, opening address, said what we're going to do is, through regulation, we're going to achieve the same bar, you know, outcomes as by the competitive market for bread. So he's going to make water and sewage by regulation just like buying bread. Um, and actually, there are three regulators there. There's Ofwat, there's the Environment Agency, and also the Competition and Markets Authority. If you look at the website, they all have these you know, goals, like motherhood. That's absolutely, no one's going to object to these goals. They point out the goals. But actually, in practice, it's much more complicated. If you look at the goals of Ofwat, can you read? Can you can you read these? I'm not sure you can read this at the back. Can you not read this at the back? No. Um, basically, what you're supposed to do, they have to regulate prices that that consumers pay. They have to develop effective competition, but that is benchmarking against different companies because you can't compete in terms of market choices. You have to organise the proper supply of water, proper disposal of sewage and develop resilient systems. Now, of course, there are complicated pressures there as to how much people are willing to pay for investment in improving water quality. And what happened was, you know, people are expert in me, that what they did was worry most about prices over this period of time. And then the Environment Agency is, is supposed to organize sustainable development and the environment. Again, these are in conflict with each other. And not only do these regulators have objections that are conflicting, but they're also in conflict with each other. The Environment Agency said uh, the Cheddar area needed a new reservoir, and off what refused to allow that to happen. And then last year, The Guardian reported again, this is a shocking thing. Um, uh, Chris Goodall produced a report to the Competition and Markets Authority, one of the three regulators, saying what you should not do is let these water industries be taken over by private equity. And what he warned was, if they were to do that, they would load the company with debt, off what would lose regulatory control, we'd get sewage everywhere. Ian Byatt, looking back in 2019, pointed out that 2004 uh, re review by off what he then left, allowed it to be taken over by private equity with these labyrinthine owner structures, and they now moved away from the London Stock Exchange. So they're free to have tax havens in, Del in, in, you know, tax in the Cayman Isles and subsidies in Delaware. Now, this is what the Environment Agency did. The Environment Agency happened to them. They, their budget was slashed. Liz Truss was one of the people who slashed the Environment Agency's budget. And it's now deemed to be completely incapable of regulating environmental quality. The blue column shows a fine that was levied on Thames Water in 2017, a then a record fine of 20 million pounds. And it does indeed look significant compared to the budget of the Environment Agency. But what we need to do 
is to look at that from the point of view of the owner of Thames Water, which was Macquarie, this Australian firm. And basically what they did, this is the, the left axis is in millions of pounds and the right axis in terms of billions of pounds. So what Macquarie did was the debt when they took over in 2007 was three billion pounds. They increased it to 11 billion pounds uh, by the time they left. They invested uh, two billion pounds in taking over the firm and they had return on investment was six billion pounds. Um, the pension fund was uh, in surplus and went into deficit under their ownership of two and equivalent. And the record fine, you just can't see. It's just so small, it's insignificant compared to the billions of pounds that are swilling around with, with Thames Water. And of course, the outcome of that is an absolute scandal about the boat race. I was talking to someone who said, you know, there were three Oxford rowers who were sick, and none of them actually felt well in the boat race. And it's even picked up by the New York Times. This is an iconic thing. I mean, for this to be happening is a true scandal. The other side of, uh, I mean, you know, of course, you know, we've got the, the, the railways, we've got electricity. Privatisation has not worked well in these areas where it's very difficult to make markets work and regulations not build the dreams that we had in the 1990s. The other part of neoliberalism is, of course, Rather than let government ownership and organised services, we should outsource that to the private sector. Now, this again is a long way from the market for bread. There's only one buyer, which is the government. Out, you know, there's only someone in the market for buying hospitals. And then what happens is, under the financialization of outsourcing, these companies all merge. Only about you know, you know, half a, most half a dozen big suppliers out there now outsource. And the government seems to be happy with that because they regard them as strategic suppliers. But what that means is, if any one of them were to exit the market, it would be completely catastrophic. It's not like a baker ceasing to buy bread. You know? um, and there are enormous barriers for new entrants. Margaret Hodge, who was chair of the Public Accounts Committee, talks about one firm having to spend three days of box files just to submit a contract to the government. You know, if you're a small firm, it's incredibly hard to get a government contract. And so you get into what we know from uh, the economics of transaction costs, the, a very difficult contracting environment. The contracts you have are what are described in economics as incomplete. You cannot completely specify what you want. If I say, I want you to build a hospital, you, you, you're, trusting uh, you know, the supplier to do a lot of the work. Um, and we know that if you have an incomplete contract and you put enormous pressure on prices, you will get poor quality. The Horizon software, which is of course at the heart of the post office scandal, was really, you know, the, 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 the people, Fujitsu, the people who supplied that, were under huge pressure to do that at low cost, because that's what government you know, outsourcing tends to do is to look for the lowest price supplier, um, which means that you get poor quality. And the other thing we know is, when, you know, I, I still teach at LSE. We have people come to talk to our students and those from private sector firms who contract the government said, when we go in, we send in our five-star generals. This is really important to us, this contract. We met civil servants in the 20s. And people basically, at the people at the top of the civil service do not think contracting is something that some few should take seriously. You just leave it to junior people. But there are a whole series of, so we don't think contracting is going to work very well, but there are a series of regulators around this. There's a remuneration committee that's supposed to make sure the, the supplier uh, delivers high performance. The pensions regulator is supposed to make sure they don't let the pension fund go into deficit. The government has a prompt payment code for all private firms that you should pay 95% investment within, within to, uh, 60 days. Auditors are there to supposedly give you know, true and proper accounts of the financial statement of the company. And because, of course, we know they don't do that, there is another body, the Financial Reporting Council, that is there to make sure that the auditors do their job properly. Uh, and unfortunately, this didn't play out too well with Carillion. You may not remember this. This was this huge strategic supplier. Uh, it was in such a parlous state. I mean, when you hear about firms going bankrupt, administrators move in and dispose of assets. 
There were no assets to dispose of. This was liquidated. It was just in such a terrible state. But the thing about the financialized world is it's an ill wind that doesn't blow anybody no good. So basically a hedge fund could see this was heading for bankruptcy and was able to make four million pounds by speculating against it against its, its liquidation. And we're not surprised that the contracting with Carillion didn't work too well. Um, they continued to issue Carillion with new contracts, despite the fact it's heading for bankruptcy. There were three profit warnings. A New York hedge fund knew this was going to bankrupt, and so it's speculating against it, but the government continues to issue its contracts. The prisons that it was contracted for were very poorly maintained, and Rory Stewart in his book says that, you know, they said, well, what on earth do you expect? The price we're paying for this contract, you can't expect us to, you can't be serious about us maintaining prison properly. The two hospitals they were building had serious structural flaws. So that's what we'd expect. Well, we would at least hope that the regulators did their job. Now, the Remuneration Committee, um, there's a report from the House of Commons Select Committee that tells its horrendous story. The Remuneration Committee actually hired a firm of consultants to benchmark the pay of their executives, chief executive, against other companies of similar size, despite the fact it's heading for bankruptcy. The pensions fund regulator knew there was something wrong, but let the pension fund incur a two billion pound deficit. The prompt payment code, this you know, this is uh, was completely ignored by Carillion. In fact, you had to. Uh, accept a discount if you paid on time. This is foreign government's a strategic supplier violating its own prompt payment code. This is a signal to the hedge fund it's going to go bankrupt. So in the end, the subcontractor left over oh, two billion pounds when it went bankrupt. The auditor was completely fragrant, in turn, and it was later find a record found by the Financial Re uh, uh, Reporting Council. But at the time, it failed to act, although it could see that that. Uh, that KPMG was, was doing things very badly. So this hasn't worked very well, this whole idea about, I mean, the, my argument is I'm not against markets. Markets are fantastic. Whether they work well, you don't want to do anything else. But what we've tried to do in a neoliberalism is to bring in private firms, give them enormous capacity to make money through financialization with very weak regulated systems of regulation can try to control them. And make sure they're delivered. This is um, about entrenched inequalities. And this, this is about the financialization of housing. Now, what's happened here, you can't see this in the back, basically, the profit per house has gone up from about 6,000 in 2009 to 60,000 in 2007. That's twice median earnings. When I first took out a mortgage back in the 1970s, I was told that you should not pay more than two and a half times your salary to get a mortgage. So now you've got firms making money <laughs> close to the limit, what we used to think is what you could afford for housing. This is a graph of median house price per earnings, uh, uh, showing that in Kensington and Chelsea, this is 34 times earnings. I'm sure this is a huge problem for you around here. You know, no young people can afford to buy a house in half of them. Um, so, and it's, you know, in uh, around the London areas, it's 20 fold, Oxford and Cambridge, it's 12 and 14 fold. Even in these deprived areas, these are the most deprived areas in Britain, it's four times average earnings. And what we've got in London, this is the United Nations report on the financialization of housing. It's what's called the hedge city. So, uh, and we've got Asian investors buying blocks of flats, flats in blocks leaving them empty, just the way to park capital. But we've also got what uh, state agencies call the Champagne Tower effect. So the billionaires move into Kensington and Chelsea, and they then displace the millionaires in the rest of London who then go out to Oxford and Cambridge. Um, now, one of the issues here, of course, is the way in which London is this center for everything, you know, entertainment, government, finance, you name it, headquarters, everyone's in London. This is analysis by the Data Analysis Financial Times, uh, Bern Murdoch, looking at how much do different cities contribute to GDP per capita in different countries. And what they find is, you know, across different countries, uh, the Netherlands 
uh, with Amsterdam. And that was a small country. Amsterdam accounts for 5% of GDP. Uh, what's London? It's 14% of GDP. So this is quite out of line with these other countries. And he also worked out the rest of the UK is poorer than Mississippi, if you take one um, I now want to look at uh, GDP per capita of the poorest regions. And here, what I've done is to compare the United Kingdom, Italy, West and East Germany. And the reason I've picked East and West Germany is, of course, because East Germany suffered communism for 40 years. As I showed at the end of communism in 1991, it had GDP per capita, a quarter of the West. What this shows is that the, uh, the, the, the red column is East Germany, the orange column is West Germany. And the poorest regions in East Germany are now at the same level as the poorest regions in West Germany. The poorest regions in Italy are those that are disfigured by organized crime. There's these varieties of organized crime. There's a, a, a notorious north-south divide in Italy. So you can understand why they're poor. Uh, but, 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 but the thing is, uh, uh, but, but, sorry, I, I can't go back now, can I? But, but, um, but, but what, what you can see, see um, sorry, I'll just, um, yeah. Can I go back up? It doesn't seem. Oh, that's right. Yeah, okay. Oh, that's fine. Yeah, okay. Thanks very much. Because uh, what you, the, the, thing, the point I wanted to make here was that the poorest regions in Britain are now poorer than the poorest regions in East Germany. So that's what's happened. They're over that period from 1990, East German regions have moved up to be like the West, and we have fallen behind. So we're worse off, our poorest regions are worse off than the poorest regions in East Germany. Um, if you look across the uh, Italy and Germany, the ratio from rich to poor, where we'd expect there to be serious structural inequalities is threefold. Uh, and in England, I'm oh, sorry, I'll go back again. In England, it's eightfold. It's an outfold difference between the inner London West and I think it's in the Northeast. So this is what I said, you know, the thing about beverage discovered in 1942, there was no need for there to be poverty and want in England. And now, as you know, there's this recent report uh, by the Resolution Foundation that 30% of children are living in poverty in England. And we now five. I, I just find this social. I just, I, we're now five times richer than we were in 1930, and yet we have 30% of children in poverty, 20% of adults. And this is the graph of where there are extreme poverty. About 25% of people living in poverty. And again, a shocking thing here is that that includes parts of London, which is one of the richest cities in the world. This is Fiona Hill's book. Uh, she, um, she achieved worldwide fame in, um, when Donald Trump, in one of the second impeachment hearing, she was his advisor on Russian policy. And if you read her book, you know, we all know how terrible Donald Trump was. Believe me, you read her book, it's just not um, But she, I mean, she's a brilliant woman and she did a doctorate at Harvard but her, she, the reason she left the UK for the United States because her father said, there's nothing for you here. And what she realized was, as she was growing up, uh, there were these three questions she was often asked, uh, which she thought were innocent questions, but were actually designed to place her and meant that everyone could ignore her because she's not going to be very important. So where are you from? Oh, your battery's running low, by the way. <laughs> I need. Okay, close that. Okay, I'm close near the end of the talk, so yeah, you can relax. It's okay, right? So, where are you from? She's from Bishop Auckland. Um, what did your father do? He's an unemployed miner. Which school did you go to? This, uh, I mean, the issue that we've got, you know, is as I talk about entrenched equality. These are how rich parents enjoy, enjoy their children, and we know that basically high income enables to buy a house in a good place and near a good school. This is an analysis of um, the, the blue column is the average 
house per price. The Kensington and Chelsea is two and a half million pounds. It's got Harpenden there. The Harpenden is uh, about a fourth, fourth from the right. Um, is about a million pounds here, the average price in Harpenden. And then the red thing is this financial data analysis, the regional, the premium you pay on top of average price price to live near a good school. Harpenden, it's, you know, it's about 50%. Uh, so you're paying about half a million pounds to live in a good school. So this is the sort of premium that you've got. So basically, of course, if you've got high income, you can ensure that you live in a good place, ensure and go to a good school. If you go to a good school, you can get a good degree. You can also then get moving to a good location. But to move there, you also need access to the bank of mum and dad. So this is the way it seems to me that we've now got entrenched inequality in Britain. So my final question to you is this. This is this lovely book, Why Nations Fail. Uh, and if, you, if, if you're in the United Nations, you, this is all about why countries are rich and some are poor. And they contrast what this guy's extractive and inclusive societies. And inclusive societies, this is the thing about the rule of law, you know, independent judiciary and so on. But basically, the key point about inclusive societies is this equality of opportunity. And the rules of the game are there to ensure that capable people can flourish and thrive and do well. Extractive societies is where an economic elite set up barriers to make sure that they preserve uh, access to the goods in society for themselves and the organized rules of the game to feed into that. So my question to you is, do you feel that Britain now is an inclusive or an extractive society. Thank you very much. They, they, they don't have the same financialized economy. Um, so the, the, there was analysis uh, by an American economist um, looking at what happened to Britain and after the Thatcher settlements um, in, in the early 1990s. And he argued that um, what Britain was characterized was, was relatively small firms, um, strong unions, and a lack of capability to form modern enterprises. Um, so he said the trouble is that what Britain needed was both the development on the finance side that were people that would lend to large corporations and large corporations that required that kind of finance. And you wouldn't, the market would not enable both these things to happen simultaneously. And he said that, that um, his view was that at the end of the Second World War, France and Germany you know, were so scarred by what had happened, they realized that society needed a fundamental change. But it didn't happen in our country. 